Okay, it is that time of year. It is emergency podcast season here at Arrowhead Pride and on the Arrowhead Pride Podcast Network. I'm here with my deputy editor, John Dixon, with one of our great film review analysts, Nate Christensen. My name is Pete Sweeney, the editor-in-chief of ArrowheadPride.com. And we actually got a couple bits of Chiefs news from this morning, but let's start with the main story. And that is that the Chiefs are signing Offensive tackle Jawan Taylor to a four-year contract from all the main newsbreakers that seem to be in, in the know. This is signifying the end of left tackle Orlando Brown Jr.'s tenure with the team. They had chosen not to franchise tag him, meaning he is heading to unrestricted free agency. Nate, you are already watching clips of Taylor, so we're happy that you're available for us here today. What have you seen so far? What do you like? Yeah, so I just watched the one game in the playoffs versus the Chargers real quick, um, and he's a truly elite pass protector. Juwan Taylor is significantly better as a pass protector than Orlando Brown Jr. Uh, there's already been some comparisons to Mitchell Schwartz, and I understand it because Taylor, he doesn't overwhelm with athleticism or he doesn't overwhelm with size or anything like that, but the technique is just so polished. He handled Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa, Kyle Van Noy, all on an island on their own. He handled them in different ways. He's just the one thing that's like truly great about him. And I know, you know, there'll be a lot of discussion about is he a left tackle? Is he a right yeah. tackle? He is a elite pass protector. We'll see if he can make that transition. But in terms of an upgrade in pass protection, it is tangible between Jawan Taylor and Orlando Brown Jr. My understanding right now is that the Chiefs see Taylor as their left tackle at this moment. They really mm -hmm. believe in his athleticism. If you take a look at this clip we put up at ArrowheadPride.com from Rise and Grind Training, no offense to our, our good friend and former Chief Orlando Brown, but these workouts seem a little bit more intense than <laughs> tennis and the underhands that we were seeing out of the, the Brown camp. Last summer, I want to follow up with you, Nate, on just the idea of him moving from right tackle to left tackle. From what you've seen so far, he seems to have the athleticism to do it. What do mm -hmm. you think the learning curve might be there? It's it's hard to say because some guys handle it well and some guys don't. It really is one of those case-by-case -case things. What I would say, though, is that his overall kind of technique and footwork from right tackle is already very sharp. It's pretty clear that he's you know, a smart player. He has a good understanding of fundamentals. So if he's able to transfer that to the left side, he, he should be able to hold up well there. There's nothing about his overall kind of athletic profile that would suggest to me that like he can't play left tackle or he can't hold up on an island. So it could be one of those things that maybe takes like a few weeks for him uh, in live reps in the NFL next season to kind of get that uh, fixed. But I, I think he can do it. It's certainly... I'm going to give the Chiefs the benefit of the doubt on this one. Andy Heck, Andy Reid, Brett Beach, they've certainly had a conversation about this. And what I would say is there's nothing about his skill set that would concern me about it. It'll be interesting to see. I, I, I'm definitely interested to see what it looks like, but I, I have more optimism the more I've thought about it. Well, there you go. He's Nate Christensen. You can catch his film review as he dives into more of this Taylor film later today at arrowheadpride.com. Thank you, Nate. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, we're continuing on with our emergency podcast as we get into the numbers of this thing. And John, not that you can't watch a little film for us, but this is your area of expertise. What do you make of this four-year, $80 million contract with the reported $60 million guaranteed? Well, this could be structured a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I could spend a lot of time playing around with numbers, but in all probability before the days out, we'll have what the actual numbers are. Yeah. And we'll be able to calculate this a lot better. To start with, I'm going to assume that Brett Veach has figured out that the first year cap hit is going to be, uh, say, less than $12 million, someplace between 6 and $12 million. And this contract doesn't sound like one that couldn't be structured where that could be done. For now, I'm just going to say that it's probably going to be around an 8 or $9 million cap hit, which gives the Chiefs um you know still some cap space uh not very much they only started with 15.2 million today but yeah. uh and and you know i could be surprised feach might have said no let's pay this as we go and we may see a move uh, later in the day that will open up cap space um but they've still got 
36 hours to get that done because it doesn't yeah. count until 3 p.m. on uh, on Wednesday. <clears throat> so, and they've if nothing else, they can always break glass in case of emergency on Patrick Mahomes' deal and get some cap space there. But there's a couple of other things they could do to raise cap space if they need it to make this deal work. As you're looking at the left tackle market, and, and again, we, we believe Taylor's going to be there, you're, you're seeing the top averages per year go Trent Williams, David Bakhtiari, and then Laramie mm-hmm. Tunsil that are all over what would be $20 million a year. Then you get mm-hmm. underneath. So again, it, it's not breaking the left tech tackle bank and, and based upon some of the things that I, I'm hearing they the Chiefs really feel that this could be one of the better left tackles in the league so in a way it could be a bargain and those players that I just mentioned Williams, Bakhtiari and Tunzel 35, 32 and 29 this is the big difference in Kansas City and, and this is in a way reminds me of the move for Justin Reed over Tyron Matthew for example I know it's a different position but you're going younger Right. And so there's just a natural advantage to that. And so the Chiefs love these deals for these guys in their mid 20 somethings that have proven they could play in the NFL and they lock them up for uh, what would be a, a really long time. And so we will see how this Taylor move impacts the Chiefs. I, I have mentioned on AP in my write up of this, the Chiefs have been connected to Tunzel as well. So I think that Taylor's going to be the left tackle uh, until he's not. Right. If this somehow Tunzel smoke <laughs> turns into fire, then my assumption is that Tunzel would be your left tackle and Taylor would be your right tackle. And you're looking at a pretty damn elite five man offensive line for the Chiefs. But again, we'll have to wait and see. If not, John, my anticipation is that Lucas Niang is going to get an opportunity at right tackle. This is the other news story of the day. Uh, and that is that Andrew Wiley has left the Chiefs, joining Eric Bieniemy and the Washington Commanders on what will be a three-year contract to become their right tackle. No huge surprise there, John. No, and I think this is another case where Eric Bieniemy is bringing in a guy, just like we said on the last editor's show, who is going to be someone who can translate what his vision for the team is uh, in the locker room, you know, at the player level. And that's a great thing for Eric Bieniemy to be doing. Um, you know, I've said many times that the Chiefs love Wiley's attitude, and I'm sure that Eric Bieniemy buys into that as well. So it's not a big surprise that a player like Wiley ends up with the commanders at this point. I'm very encouraged uh, by what Nate was telling us about Taylor here. Yeah. But, you know, even if you think that, this is yet another situation where we get a right tackle that we're moving to left tackle and he's not much better than Orlando Brown was. Let's 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 call that the worst case scenario. What would the Chiefs have done here is gotten a guy for less than they could have paid Orlando Brown mm-hmm. and who will play where <laughs> they want him to play, which yeah. Orlando Brown was not willing to do. So if it turns out he needs to play right tackle, he'll do it. And uh, so I think this is this is almost almost has to be a positive at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, I had mentioned those left tackle contracts without a doubt. Orlando Brown is going to be over that, in my opinion. Right. And I, mm-hmm. I think he's going to be making more money than this contract was. So I think it's a, a win there. Steve, a lot of offensive line movement. Steve Serta, our Arrowhead Pride podcast producer. What's your initial reaction as Kansas City joins the frenzy, as they say, Steve? <laughs> Well, I, I like Joan Taylor, and yeah, he he's younger, and I, I think that he is a good offensive lineman. Now, I don't know if the Chiefs built up their confidence from Orlando Brown being a right tackle <laughs> and them mo- having re- uh, quite a bit of success, really, I, I guess, uh, moving him to left tackle. Now they're like, we can just do this every year. We'll just move these guys all along the offensive line, but my initial thought when they signed him and when the, when the details of the contract came out was like maybe left tackle still in play, but instead of a Laramie Tunsil trade, this is a we're going to try to attack this position in the NFL draft. We've still got a mm-hmm. lot of draft picks. Maybe we can move up and try to get our left tackle in the future there, which would make a lot of sense because you're paying Joe Tooney a lot of money. Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith are guys that could be coming up for contracts here in the next couple of years. And you have to figure out what you're doing here. So you have Lucas Niang, you bring in Jawan Taylor, who could be a plug and play right tackle guy. And then you try to go draft a left tackle. So you still have some flexibility along the offensive line with the cheap rookie contract at that premium position. 
But if they're automatically moving him to left tackle, I, I tend to agree with you, Pete, that it probably means Lucas Niang is right. going to be their starting right tackle next season. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't try to attack right. the offensive line in the draft and, and try to still move up possibly or, or do something there to try to beef up the offensive line, which is something that is very important to them. And that's why they haven't, you know, just stood back and watched these things mm -hmm. unfold over the last couple of years. That's why they were super active this year and saying, okay, Orlando's hitting the market. We're not going to do it. But then immediately you hear while well, they're talking to teams about possibly trading and immediately it's Laramie Tunsil. And then it's, oh no, they just signed Juwan Taylor to a big deal. And <laughs> I don't, I don't hate the move because it, there is flexibility there. If you think that he can be your starting left tackle, well, the contract that you just gave him, like you guys already mentioned, is relatively cheap compared to what the tackles are going to be commanding moving forward yeah. and what Orlando Brown is probably asking for right now. So you pay him kind of high-end right tackle money, but you can move him to left tackle if you need to. Then you still try to draft and develop some guys. And then now all of a sudden you've got some flexibility along the offensive line. So I think there's good process with this move. I think that he is a good player who is going to be really good for the Kansas City Chiefs, just depending on how they deploy him. There's just still a lot of other question marks that, that I'm trying to piece together just based <laughs> on the details of this one contract. Well, the bonus is that there's time, right? I mean, now you're you're joining the Chiefs on what would be negative two day of free agency day one of free agency. He will presumably be a Kansas city chief when we get to there on, on Wednesday. But that means he can work at left tackle, the entire off season program, get in there with Andy heck. You can get those reps during what would be training camp and, and then into the preseason games. Two reminders here for chiefs fans that are panicking with all this movement. The chiefs converted Orlando Brown to a left tackle. I know that he had that mixed year right before coming to the Kansas City Chiefs in 2020 due to injuries to, I believe it was Ronnie Stanley, but the year before he was predominantly a, a right tackle playing every snap there. And the Chiefs were able to move him and, and be a serviceable player at left tackle. And then when it comes to Lucas Niang, if you try to think back to prior to Niang suffering this injury, they were pr preferring him over Wiley when both of these guys were healthy. It's just that injuries happened and Wiley had to step in and then did a pretty solid job. And we have seen the tendency from Andy Heck, the offensive line coach and Andy Reid in the past is when the offensive line is cooking, let's not mess with that. And I think you saw them roll with Wiley for a long time. And he earned that contract that he was waiting for. I mean, he had a lot of one year deals. And so I think he was waiting for that three year contract. He moves on to Washington where, he, where he's certainly going to play. We know Eric the enemy likes him. Um, and so I think this is a, just a, a very fluid situation. I think today, right. If the chiefs had to line up and, and play week one tomorrow, thankfully they don't. I, I think for sure Taylor would be the left tackle, but this right. is a long process. We'll see how the draft goes as Steve mentioned. And we will see, you know, when it comes to other players that, that could join Kansas city one way or another. The other thing I want to talk about from today, big AFC West news. Do you have Patrick Mahomes? You have Justin Herbert. You have Russell Wilson and Jimmy Garoppolo joins the division <laughs> to, to, to try to unseat what will be Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs who have won six straight AFC titles, uh, AFC West titles, uh, Jimmy G joining the Raiders, John, what was your initial reaction to that? Well, I can't say that I'm surprised, you know, uh, the Raiders tried to do this by spending money last year and it didn't work out for them. Um, uh, maybe this time they'll do a little better after all, yeah. uh, Jimmy Garoppolo took the 49ers to the Super Bowl, uh, to play the chiefs in the, after the 2019 season, he's certainly capable, has the experience of, playing at a championship level. Um, but, you know, he has not been able to really get it done with San Francisco, and the Raiders are now on the hook for a three-year deal that's worth uh, $67.5 million and $34 million guaranteed, according to the numbers that are, that are out there right now. So, um, you know, yet another case where a division or AFC opponent has decided to spend a lot of money to try and dethrone the Chiefs. Whether or not it'll work... Well, we'll just have to see. I wouldn't I wouldn't put my money on it. I've always liked I, I know that a lot of people are laughing today because of how the Raiders moved on from Derek Carr. And then instead they go and get Jimmy G and people are like, well, why did you do that? It's the same quarterback. I don't know if I feel the exact same way because I, I just feel 
and I, maybe this is more of a feel thing, Steve, and I know that quarterback wins are, are, are not a stat necessarily, but I just feel like Jimmy G is a guy who is not going to mistake, make mistakes and cost you a game, and you could win with Jimmy G, whereas Derek Carr, it, I felt like there were certain times when Derek Carr was playing so poorly that you just simply couldn't win with Derek Carr. I mean, you look at Jimmy G's career record, and I under, like I said, I understand the QB win is not a stat thing, but 40 and 17. Just reminds me a lot of Alex Smith, mm-hmm. and I think the Raiders yeah. will just be a more solid team that occasionally could give the Chiefs a run for their money than this team that, you know, once in a blue moon, maybe they did it. I know they had the one good year where for a while before the injury, Carr was a, an MVP candidate, but that feels especially fluky now. But I think this solidifies the Raiders at, uh, of if they could build the re- around Garoppolo, the rest of the team, and maybe they could be this every year team that's threatening to be a wild card like i said i don't know if they're necessarily going to unseat the chiefs but i like garoppolo a little bit more than Carr. where do you land on that steve uh, i they're very similar quarterbacks i think Derek carr is probably a little bit better than jimmy garoppolo i think, think the biggest thing like the the biggest thing here is that jimmy garoppolo is cheaper than Derek carr and it was over like Josh McDaniels made it clear that he was not going to move forward with Derek Carr in any way with the Raiders. And so it's, it's just a cheaper move for, I think similar quarterback play, but Jimmy Garoppolo has also made a glass and misses a lot of football games. So yeah. I think we can pretty <laughs> much guarantee that he's not going to play an entire regular season calendar for the Raiders. And I still think even with as bad as the Broncos were, I think Sean Payton makes a big difference for Denver headed into next season. So the Raiders are still the worst team in the division with Jimmy Garoppolo or with Derek Carr. It doesn't really matter who they have under center at this upcoming. Well, what, what is ironic about what you're saying is also in this frenzy, and this is a little bit less frenzier than the other frenzied moves, is that Jared Stidham became the Broncos backup yeah. today. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so if Jimmy G were to miss time, the Raiders are down to Chase Garbers as their current backup here on March 13th. So <laughs> things remain interesting in the AFC West. We will keep updating you if there's any more big time moves impacting the Kansas City Chiefs. This, I imagine, will be the first of a couple emergency podcasts as we go here. But the Chiefs landing Jawan Taylor. A very, very good 25-year-old right tackle who they have slated right now to be the left tackle. The big news is the Chiefs moving on from both their tackles of the Super Bowl championship season with Orlando Brown presumably now going elsewhere and Andrew Wiley joining the Washington Commanders. And so we will be watching this blueprint built by Brett Veach as we go. Thank you to Nate Christensen for joining us. Thank you to John Dixon. And, of course, Stephen Serta. This has been another Emergency Podcast right here on the Airhead Pride Podcast Network.